Beauty and the Beast podcast with Felicia Michaels and Joey Diaz brought to you by BallCancerSucks.com and TaintedVisionArts.com. You've been dressing up lately. You look beautiful. That's right. You look very nice, but your legs do need a little bit of something. I gotta tell you. I, know, I got the white. Just a little legs. bit, not a lot. Just a little bit. You gotta rub some number four. My on legs there. are as white from the knee down as yours are from the knee up. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you gotta put number four on them or something. I Get know, out there for I a few know, hours. I know. You know I know. See? It's terrible. Very surprisingly, uh, you've lived in New York, and, uh-huh. and, and I see it in you. I see that you've picked up little New Yorker things. You. You trust, you know, like you just a little bit more. And it's weird that I went back this week. And I want to thank everybody who came to the show at the Grand Ballroom. And if I see you at the UFC, I had a great time with you motherfuckers. But it's really weird that at one point or not, I was standing there. It was 50th Street. And I'm like, in reality, 40-something years ago, I was walking around 33 blocks ago. The one thing I did do, I went to Central Park. Oh, you did? I went to Central Park and smoked a number with my man Omar. And uh, we sat there and I looked at the rocks. And, you know, your mind runs away with you. How many people have been on these rocks? And, you know, John Lennon used to walk in the park. Oh, and, yeah. You know, New yeah. York is so powerful in so many fucking ways. And I tell people, that, you know what, man? I'm not one of those guys that sits here and go, you know, you can't eat a bagel for the New York. I don't give a fuck, man. Those days are long gone. But the weird thing is that when you're in New York, you realize the power of it. You know, I yeah. tell people all the time, look, it's nice where you live and California is real nice, but when New York sneezes, everybody catches a, a fucking cold, okay? That's the power in New York. But the w- really weird thing is that I can't fucking sleep at night when I travel anymore, Felicia. That, people think I don't go on the road. I don't go on the road because I can't fucking sleep in hotel rooms. Really? Oh my, and the nicer the hotel? Really? No fucking sleep. Not me. I'm in a hotel room. I just want, I just want, I am like Snoozeville. Remember those hotels where you had the air conditioner that blow the curtain up in the yeah. middle of the night? And, yeah. But they, you got up in the middle of the night and you're like, I got to either get out of here or turn this motherfucker off. They're going to find me dead. Uh-huh. Like, I like those. I don't like these new, it says 60 on the wall, but it's really 92 in the fucking room. I got the windows open, so I can't sleep, Felicia. So the first night I went downstairs at 4.45 in the morning. Thursday night into New York City. I was so excited. I said, I'm going to go. I'm going to walk around the city. I'm going to buy a fucking pack of cigarettes and some fucking coffee at Dunkin' Donuts or somewhere. And I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to see different people. Who's out at 4 in the morning? You know how many people I fucking seen out at 445 on 50th Street? How many? Like six. (laughs) <laughs> and I walked all the way to Times Square. The city was dead on a Thursday night. But that's the best time to, I think, to see New York sometimes is like when no one else is out. <sighs> Felicia, I didn't go to, you know, I grew up in New York and it's very tough to describe to people when it was a, a filthy, filthy, filthy fucking city. If you ever want to see videos, go to the first scene from our Latin thing and look at the streets of New York in the 70s. It was a fucking disgust. I remember on 88th Street on the west side playing with rats, like killing rats on the street. You don't see rats. You know, since yeah, then, yeah. how many fucking rats I've seen on the street? One or two in 30 years in comparison to 10 in one year on 88th Street. You know why? Even if the neighborhood was clean, the people were clean, those rats were in your shit in those days. Uh-huh. And it's so weird to see that city now, like they cleaned it up. Yeah. And it's fucking beautiful. But there's also a downswing to that. They took the element of danger out of New York, which is why the tourists went to New York. You know, like one guy said to me, yeah, you get weed delivered to your hotel. That's great. Big fucking deal. In the old days, you had to take a cab ride up to Harlem. You weren't going to get mugged. It took the element of danger from you. You go to Times Square, you can't get, listen, who the fuck are you kidding? You don't know what life is till you get off a bus in New York City at 7 a.m and stand outside one of those pervert worlds. There used to be one where the Laugh Factory moved into New Uh York. Before that, that was pervert world. I don't know what the name of it was, but it was pervert world to me because it was the size of the comedy store. But when you went there at 7 in the morning, Felicia, you would see people that were businessmen going in there. They're going to a peep show, which is the lowest level of masturbation. When the window goes up and people are fucking in the middle and you whack off on your shoes, and then some little guy comes in and mops the fucking floor behind you. That's the lowest sense of masturbation because you're basically masturbating in public. You're not even masturbating in your own fucking house. These guys were on the bus from wherever. You know how many buses right, come into New right. York City? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and these guys were all on that bus thinking about we can't get to get the perv world so we could see. But they still have places like that no, in New they York. Don't. They, yes, they do. Where? 
I walked up and down Times Square, not to be a visitor, but just to, I had the bloggy really? with me. Really? I think I dog, remember when I lived dog. there, but it's been a while since dog, I lived yeah, there. Oh, yeah, no. Really? No, it's 2012. No, yeah. man. It's fucking, I went to the village on Friday night after the show. I don't think they should have cleaned up stuff like that because then now guys like that are going to be on the train doing it to people on the train. Like, you, people need to Can have a place to go. Can you imagine going on a train and just whacking off take? I could do it. People do Take that. my dick yeah. out real slow and cappuccino it. Just take the helmet where the skin is and machine gun it real fast and shit. <laughs> you look and like just, you're trying to measure out an inch oh, when yeah. you talk about holding your yeah, penis. Yeah, you just hold, you just hold <laughs> your little helmet and go real fast like this up on top. Like, like a machine gun and just come and your on helmet somebody's leg. kind of little, Joey. I no, don't mean to no, 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 <laughs> bust on you. <laughs> yeah, but you come on somebody's little leg, it's tremendous. And as as when you come, do you come a lot? Oh, please, gallons. No. <laughs> look at the, look at the size of my nut sacks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you got some big <laughs> Yeah, what do you think is in there? <laughs> fucking juice? That's straight up fucking milk, milk, lemonade. And that was fucking nutsacks. You nut do sacks. have the biggest nutsacks on the planet. No, that day, first of all, let's get something straight. That day where you see me, I was trying to work hard to cover the helmet and shit like that. <laughs> Once I rubbed the helmet and shit, I'll fucking choke you with this fucking key when I go. Because you know when I took the picture of Joey's balls for the thing he did on Facebook, <laughs> and Joey's got some big old meaty fucking hands. Let me tell you, you got some, you got some like no, farmer plow. Those yeah, are, are big monsters. ass fucking hands. And then he holds a little pigita, and and his balls were so big and still. Next to the big old meaty hands, those were some fucking bull balls. Those oh, are. Please, you know? We don't fuck around. That's a straight up half a Man, gallon. Man, you of look fucking... like you were smuggling pumpkins. Yeah, if I work out for like three or four days and don't whack off and uh -huh. give you a load of that, it's amazing. People, you could drown someone. I'll drown them. You could <laughs> waterboard <laughs> someone with your sperm. Yeah, okay. they'll, 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 they'll be like a fucking little mobile. Tell me where the safe is. Yeah. Squirt, squirt, squirt. Send the wall. Look at Felicia Michaels and shit. <laughs> we got a great guest today. Yes, we do. We're back, bitches. This is what I'm talking about, Felicia. Uh-huh, Joey Diaz. Felicia Michaels in the house looking beautiful. We got our man, the writer, director. This guy has worked with some tremendous fucking talents. I mean, Felicia looked him up. I can't believe he's sitting next to us. How about a round of applause my main man, Mr. Rocco Urbisi? Woo! Rocco! Wow, I'm very honored that you're sitting in that spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't believe it. Tell us, uh, you you have been in the comedy business for how long? Mm, 35 years. Yeah? 30, 35 years. So I'm reading about you, and tell how you got into the comedy business. On what show? I had a friend of mine who was doing a show in L.A., with a legend that was on his last journey, a guy named Steve Allen. The guy's name was Woody Frazier. Woody Frazier created the Mike Douglas Show, The View, Good Morning America. And I knew Woody because he's from my hometown of Cleveland. And when I was a kid, I would go to the television station at night to make money, and I worked in the art department. And Woody was this hot shot guy. You know, he was producing a local show. And um, he st I started doing graphics and stuff. And so I knew it was coming out of here. And I called him up. He said, come on, I'll give you a job. So he got me a job. And it was Mr. Allen's last hurrah. And of course I knew who he was because I'm a big fan of late night television. I'm a big fan of all late night television television in general, uh, even going back to when Burl and all those people started, because I do maintain the hardest science or art is stand-up comedy. Joey's crazy. He thinks he can stand in front of an audience every two or three minutes and make people laugh. You pick that out of the profession, you're out of your mind. That's why I love these guys, because they, they're standing there naked every night, and they do it. So he got me a job on The Allen Show. And I was booking, writing, producing, getting lunch because it was a very small staff. So he started booking, you know, Jack Benny, Milton Burrow, and those guys. And I'm booking Steve Martin, George Carlin, Jay Leno, David Letterman. What year is this? This is 70, it's got to be 72, 73. Uh, how old were you at that time? 
I was about 21 years old. Oh my God. Did you understand at that time how fucking cool that was? No. Because see, I, I also was, I was going to the improv and I was going to the comedy store and I got to be friends with Letterman because he was the MC and I went to the comedy store because the only comics that were allowed to go to the comedy store and the improv were Pryor and Robin Williams. So I got to know Robin and I didn't know Pryor very well. So what happened was, make a long story short, they canceled the Allen show, I didn't have a job. And a friend of mine named Beth Uffner called me up and said, hey, I'm doing this pilot for NBC called The Midnight Special. And they don't know anything about music. I'm also a music freak. So anyway, I do the show. And at that time, just like in comedy, I didn't know Errol Smith was going to be Errol Smith or, you know, got stung with Marvin Gaye in a garage in Atlanta. I, you know, I don't know. You know, the pips are the pips. And, and I booked Pryor to host the show. And I was told by my executive producer that if he didn't show up, I wouldn't get paid and that I might get fired. I was married. I had already one child and my wife was pregnant. So Pryor showed up and I kept going in and out of the dressing room back and forth. And he said to me, motherfucker, are you babysitting me? I said, absolutely. <laughs> so what are you talking about? I said, the boss said, if you don't, you don't show up, I get fired. I got a wife and two kids. And he laughed. Did the show. He was great. And I was on the Midnight Special for a couple of years. And then the definitive moment that, this, that, that hit me is when Saturday Night Live went on the air. I was so jealous because that's the show I want to do. I was so jealous. I went, damn, that's what I should be doing. How can I come up with something equally as cool? So I kept going to the comedy store every night watching Richard, watching Richard, watching Richard. And finally he said to me, motherfucker, what do you want? <laughs> I said, if I can get you an NBC special or any special, would you do it? He said, go sell it. I went to Bert Sugarman, who was my boss in Midnight. He thought I was crazy, but he went to Dick Ebersol, who then became the president of NBC Sports, and a great guy named Brandon Tartikoff, who passed away. They decided to do prior because Ebersol was responsible for Lorne Michaels getting Saturday Night Live with Bernie Brostein. Mm -hmm. We did the special, but I couldn't produce it because I had no credits and I was supposed to be the producer head writer. My agent called me up and said, do the special. I said, no, I want to produce the special. I came up with the idea. I sold Richard on the idea. Why am I not? Because you don't have credits. Take the head writing credit, and if the series gets picked up, you'll be the producer. I said, there may not be a series. He said, do it. So I was really angry. I didn't talk to Richard because I thought maybe he had sold me out. By the way, my, head, my uh, writing partner was Alan Thick. Funny, right? <laughs> amazing. It's just amazing. I so, like I'm walking down Universal at 11 o'clock at night, and I just done a pilot for MCU, MCA Universal called The American Flyer, which I didn't pick up. The American Flyer had three hosts, which is like magazine format. Tom Selleck, Michelle Lee, and Dan Rowan. The Rowan reporters were David Letterman on comedy and health and business with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Wow, wow. The house band was the Pointer Sisters. Dang. <laughs> wow. They hated it. They thought Letterman was not funny and this dumb Australian, you know, was never going anywhere, and why didn't I have a conventional band? So they had the big nappy convention in Miami. And 
they put us at the end of the hall, the smallest room they could give us, because they, you know, get rid of it. And there was a guy sitting there watching it, and he was laughing his ass off. But I'm not making this up. I'm telling you, this is amazing sequence of events that everybody has. You have it in your life, and you have it at yours. But I'm sitting here talking about this, and I'm even thinking this is bizarre. <clears throat> guy stands up, he says, you guys, this is a really funny pilot, but this is never going on TV. It's just too cool. I said, well, thanks a lot. He gives me his card. Show didn't get picked up for syndication. I'm packing my stuff. I see the card, and I look at it. I throw it in the waste paper basket. It says Ted Turner. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it saying Ted Turner. And the only reason I remember it, because he said, starting as all, you know, the new all 24-hour news, I went, that's not doing me, and I threw it in the paper basket. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm walking down Universal late at night, and here comes a limousine. And the window rolls down, and it's Pryor. He says, how come you haven't called me? I said, I'm gonna talk to you, man. I sell the show, I do all this, and I don't get to be the producer? He said, just do the show, man. Everything will be cool. So I made my deal that if the pilot got picked up, I'd be the producer head writer of the Richard Pryor series. Belushi was the first guest. Do you remember a guy named Falstaff Wild? No. Falstaff Wild was this over the top, I mean way over the top gay comic. He was hilarious. He was friends with Paul Mooney. What happened was Paul Mooney and I met, Paul Mooney and I wrote the Richard Pryor special. You can talk to anybody, ask Paul. The other guys on the, on the show were they didn't understand. We did, they would write stuff which would throw in a basket and whatever Paul and I wrote. So Falstaff Wild is the guy in the slave ship with the whip. If you remember the Richard Pryor? Uh-huh. Okay. It's a slave ship. And he's whipping. And John Belushi is the... No, John Belushi is the whipping guy. And he's the captain's helper. And Pryor's on one of the guys on the oar. And Falstaff Wallace comes in and Belushi says, What do you want? He said, the captain wants another, another one. He said, ah, they come and go. I'll, I'll pick another one. They, you, know, you, and Pryor goes, no, not me, you. And they grab him and they fight. He says, you're going to do your own network special, not me. And they throw him through the door, and he's in the hallway at NBC dressed in a tuxedo. And that's how the <laughs> Richard Pryor special started. Well, well, Falstaff was so big that Belushi had a problem. So Belushi's threatening, maybe not do the show, because Falstaff's still on the scene. So Richard said, come with me. Me, Paul Mooney, Dick Eversall, John Belushi, and Bruce Sugarman. And this is Richard. John, I respect you. You're a fantastic artist. I like the way the scene is playing, man. And I hope you do it. And Belushi did it. See, that's what I talk about when you cut through the bullshit and you get to the core of what the problem is because nobody's out to offend anybody. Nobody's trying to hurt anybody's feelings. When it's working, it's working. And if Richard taught me anything, if you laugh, don't analyze it. Don't try to break it down and don't try to mess with it. It's funny. You know, you can hone it and, and it depends on who you cast, but it's funny. What are you going to fuck with it for, right? So we did the special. Maya Angelou did that great soliloquy when uh, he played Willie the Drunk. But here's the thing that defined my moment with Richard. I went to him, I said, I want to book the Pips. And he said, you mean Gladys Knight and the Pips? I said, no, the Pips, just Pips. He started laughing. He said, what are they going to do? He said, midnight train to Georgia. I called up Bubba Knight in Georgia, because he did Midnight. I said, Bubba, it's Rocco. I want to book the Pips. He said, well, Gladys is doing a movie. I said, no, no, just you guys. And what do you want us to do? Midnight train to Georgia. Just your part. They flew to Georgia. They had all these charts. We went into studio, re-rehearsed this and recorded a track. 
And the announcer, ladies and gentlemen, shot of an empty microphone where Gladys would be, and the pips. Mm, da, da, bum, 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 bum. Leaving on that midnight train to Georgia. Ooh, ooh, that's all it was, <laughs> right? <laughs> and Richard died. I mean, we all died. So the series got picked up, and I couldn't believe it. I'm going to be the producer of a primetime show starring Richard Pryor. And there were problems with that, too. They tried to stick me with another producer, and I said, no, I'm holding fast, because I knew behind my back was Richard. See, once you have someone who has your back, and he's the 10,000-pound gorilla, you can get pretty cocky, right? I had to take less money to be the producer than the guy that was the co-producer and the director, because that was my deal. And if Richard didn't show up, I'd get fired. <laughs> right? So we hired a writing staff, and of course, the rep company, because I was so envious of Saturday Night Live's rep company. <laughs> you know, I love those guys. I, Belushi and those guys. That, what a, that's an incredible cast. I mean, when you go back, I, I, I watch Saturday Night Live even now. I, I, I see how the show goes through hills and valleys, but come on, look at what that show has produced. Get serious. I mean, great. Lauren Michael has a great eye for talent. Fantastic. So anyway, <clears throat> Sandra Bernhardt, Robin Williams, Tim Reed, Marshall Warfield, Jimmy Martinez, you know, they were all great. And they were all interchangeable parts, right? This is the Richard Pryor show. Yeah. yeah. So we'd have these rehearsals. <clears throat> and Richard had a guy come in, he had a dashiki hat, he had a cane, and he'd never say anything. He'd walk in, he'd sit in the corner. And finally, I said, Rich, who is that? He said, his name is Prophet Jennings. And I said, who's Prophet Jennings? He says, he's the nigger expert. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Oh, no. So, <laughs> so we did the show. And, we, and um, we were going great until we did the uh, uh, naked opening. You know what the naked opening was? Okay. So Richard calls me and I said, we need an opening for the show. It has to be definitive. It has to say what I'm giving up to do this. Because I am giving up a lot here. People are saying I have to give up my, my credibility, my, my art and all that stuff. I said, what do you want to do? So I have this idea. Paul had this idea. What do you think? He thinks we should do Frankenstein, where they bring in a black, bring in, they bring in a me, and then they bring a white guy, and they transpose my brain. And I get up and go, hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Richard Pryor Show. God, am I glad to be here as a white guy. And I said, that's great. So we started to write it. And then he said, call me up at 2 in the morning. And I was like, Rocco, Richie. You know, I could barely hear him. I want to do the opening where I got no, no dick. And no balls. I go, what? Can you get me a makeup guy? I want to be standing naked with no dick and no balls. I'll tell you when I see you tomorrow. The guy I hired was a guy named Rick Baker, who did Star Wars. He did all the Star Wars characters. Rick Baker brought in all the Star Wars characters, and we did Star Wars Bar. Remember that thing where we played Mudbone? Right. Yeah. So here was the opening. So we brought Richard in. He put a, uh, like a, pair of dickies or I mean uh, uh, jockey you know shorts and they covered him up with makeup on a chair you know on those chairs you have to stand on when you take the chair away he couldn't move very much but there he is standing there like a mannequin and this is what he said opens up with a tight shot and he says hi I'm Richard Pryor a lot's been written about should I do a show or shouldn't I do a show well, I'm going to do a show, by golly. And they say, Rich, if you do a show, you have to give up everything. I'm standing here naked, and I'm giving up absolutely nothing. Cut the head to toe. He's got no balls and no dick. <laughs> right? Hilarious. I go down, I edit it, put it on the beginning of the show. And John Moffat was a director. He was great. We put it on the show. 
the show is going to air that night and we're all excited. I get a call from my agent saying NBC's going to edit out the naked opening. And I said, why? They think it's too controversial. They want you to edit it out. I said, did Richard say it was okay? He says, I don't know. I call Richard. I said, you know they're going to edit out the naked opening? He said, never heard a damn thing about it. What are you talking about? NBC just called me. want me to go down and edit it out. I'm not going to edit it out if you don't want it out. He said, I'll talk to you later. I call back NBC and I say, I'm not editing it out. What are you talking about? You work for the network. I go, no, 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 no. The network hired me. I work with Richard Pryor. They said, you're fired. Next thing I know is a press conference. Richard Pryor quit the NBC series over the naked opening. And here's the irony how sometimes art prevails. The Richard Pryor show was on every major news network. It got more exposure than if they left it alone. It was on NBC News, CBS News. It was on the wire, UP wire, when they used to have the wire. It was all over the place, and he quit. Now, we only did four shows. So the shows that we didn't do, there's a lot of material that we don't like Dunk the Darky. You know, it's a lot of really funny shit, but you'll never see it. <laughs> so the show got canceled, and um, he went off, and I got a call from Alan King. I did a special with Alan King. I did two specials with Lily Tomlin, uh, two book musicals, and I won an Emmy. Um, and then I went to the Wadsworth Theater. I saw George Carlin's name. I hadn't seen George in six, seven years. I bought a ticket. I went to the show. I went backstage. He pulled me out in the hallway. He said, you want to do my next HBO special? And I said, yeah. I did 10 of them after that. Wow. Now, you talk about loyalty. Who hires anybody? for 10 specials. What, it is, what do you think it is about yourself that uh, led them to work with you? You know what I mean? Like, what was the connection, do you think? <laughs> because you I have had, worked with two of the greatest comedic yeah. minds in, in history, you know? Like, how did, how did you do that? I think part of it is uh, luck, I guess. Um, I think part of it is the fact that um, uh, I don't know how to say this without saying it. I'll just say it. Guys like Joey, anybody, like I said before, even if I'm not a fan of that comedian, it's a courageous, you got to really be courageous to do that and there's a certain amount of uh, it's the, uh, I love the courage of people that that want to do that and can do that and there are a lot of people who are funny but there's a lot of people who are really funny and I think the people who are really funny are the ones are the risk takers they do not think about making money they do not think about success they think about their art if there is a connection I'm a I'm a painter by, I started out being a painter, I, I paint. And I don't paint for anybody, I paint for me. If you're a comedian, you gotta do it for you. You can't worry about what the audience is gonna laugh at or what the audience think. You gotta believe in your heart and in your, and in your, in your as deep as you can go that this is your voice and you've got something to say. And if you don't do that, you will be successful, but you won't get there. And guys like Lenny Bruce paid a price. Richard paid a price. George paid a price. You don't, you don't get there without paying a price. If you're willing to pay the price and you really believe in what you're doing, then you'll get there. And let's not forget, it is a job. You, you get paid for it. But that isn't the primary goal. 
So I think maybe the connection was best put by my girlfriend when she said, Richard Pryor loved you because you were young and innocent, and George did because you weren't. And I think that's true. I said to Joey, if I'd have done it in reverse, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I'd have fallen on a grenade for Richard. You wrote, co-wrote with Richard. Uh, Jojo Dancer. Jojo Dancer. How did that come about? Yeah. I mean, how did that whole process, you talk him into it, he talked you into it. I mean, it's a masterpiece of a movie. If you're a guy like me who really understood, yeah. it fucking blew my mind. And when I heard, when <laughs> I had read that you had written it, I was baffled for years. And whenever it's on, I stop what the fuck I'm doing. That's what that movie means to me. Oh. Because I relate to it in a way. I stop what the fuck I'm doing. I was living in an apartment on the Ventura County line. I just separated from my, from my wife and it was a very difficult. Uh, two kids and it was really hard. And I found this place, a little apartment on the beach, miles from anybody. Try to figure out stuff, you know. And I was literally on the toilet, and my phone rang. <laughs> and Richard said, Rocco, it's Richie, what are you doing? I said, you wanna know what I'm doing? He said, yeah. So I'm uh, taking a dump. He said, well, after you wipe your ass, come and see me at Columbia. <laughs> 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 so <coughs> I went to Columbia, and uh, he said, I'm gonna write a movie about my life. And I said, you're kidding. And I'd like you to write it with me. I said, Rich, come on, man. I mean, this is, you know, David Mamet. I mean, come on, man. You, you know, uh, uh, William Goldman. I mean, me. He said, no, I want you to write it with me. Because I, I'll be able to tell you stuff. And it's going to be, I just need you to be there. I, I will take you through the story. You just tell me how to, how to help me get there. So... He flew me to Hana, where he had a place, and for four weeks, I get up in the morning, go see him about 10, we ride from about 10 to 1. There's nothing to do in Hana, you know. Who is Hana? Hawaii. Okay. There's nothing to do there. Nothing. So I, at one o'clock, I'd get lunch and I go. Not for comedy guys. Comedy guys, you can't take to a beach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, fuck it. That's right. <laughs> so I'd go lunch one o'clock, and then from like two or three, I'd play basketball with the Samoans and get beat up because they're not very graceful. They're just big and they hurt you, right? And then I go back about five and work with Richard till about eight, and then have the night off. Well, at the end of the month, we had about 160 pages of stuff. <clears throat> Came back to LA and we started doing the editing. I'm sorry, but when you were going through this process with Richard Pryor, did he tell you stuff where you were like, like completely blown away? I mean, yeah, there's stuff, I, there's stuff, there's stuff he told time. me about his living with his, his, uh, his mom was a prostitute and his dad's, it's so personal, I, I won't even share it today. It was, it was very, very personal, and, I, and I, I won't. But the fact that he did expose himself gave me an insight of how we could, you know, get to where we had to go. When we got the thing cut down to some pages, he called me in his office. He said, they think the movie is too serious, and they want it to be funnier. And I go, what do you mean? They want me to do more stand-up. And I said, Rich, you can't write new material for this. It'll take a year. He said, no, I'll use some of my stuff and we'll, f we'll bring in Paul and he'll figure out how to make the monologues work. And I never liked that. I thought that it was the studio's way of saying, we can put out a Richard Pryor show where people still know it's Richard Pryor. Remember that great movie Adam Sandler did? 
that a Mike Ban a Mike Binder director he looked like he looked yes, like yes now here's an, here's a, here's a really an interesting thing I thought that was a great movie me too I, I thought Sandler and Binder did great work and it didn't make money because people don't want Adam Sandler no and he was a, and I'll tell you he was a fantastic smoking in that movie oh it, he was unbelievable well that's the same problem we had with Pryor they thought it needed to be funnier. So the process got to be really difficult and making the movie was not, didn't turn out to be much fun because we had network meddling, pounding them, pounding them, pounding them, trying to maintain a storyline while this pressure to be funny was on him. It was very hard. What was he like under that pressure as a person? Well, he was also the director. And the DP, oh, and he, I didn't realize that. Yeah, and oh, he, the DP, God bless his soul, John Alonzo, did some great work. Jeremiah Johnson, I mean, John Alonzo was heavyweight dude, but they didn't get along because John Alonzo thought he should direct the movie. <laughs> Everybody thought they should direct the movie. In fact, I show up on the lot at Universal. Excuse me. And John Wilson was the PI guy. Because Rocco, we have a problem. Richard won't come out of his trailer. I said, are you shitting me? This is like a, a bad grade B Hollywood movie. Why not? John Alonzo parked in his parking place. <laughs> I go, wait a minute, John. Are you telling me that my job now is to get John Alonzo to move his car? He said, Richard ain't coming out and John ain't moving. So I knock on Richard's door and I go, and he's laughing. He goes, how's your morning so far, nigger? I said, it's uh, starting off pretty good. I'll be right back. <laughs> By the way, the first time he called me that, he called me that in front of his friends, and they took offense to it because they were objecting that this white boy was doing his show, and he said, I didn't see you come to me with the idea. And this guy came to me with the idea. So shut the fuck up. So I go to, to John Alonzo. And he always liked to have a hat on shipping. I said, hey, John, how you doing this morning? I said, I'm doing all right. You're in Richard's spot. Yeah, I'm Richard's spot. I had no place to park. I said, John, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you to move your car, and you're going to say no. And then it's going to go to John Wilson. Then John Wilson's going to go to head of production. And head of production's going to go to head of studio. If head of the studio comes down to this set, not only will you be fired, you'll be persona non grata in the business. <coughs> Just move the car. $40,000 an hour, move the car. And he moved it. And we got to shoot the show. We got the film. So, you know, some of the weird stuff that, you know, every movie has its story. Every movie's got its incredible story. Making JoJo Dancer was not an easy task. And what year was this? 82. 84. And what were the years you were around prior? Michael? Well, I was rich. I was with Richard from all of 77, 78. I helped him. Uh, um, I uh, I went down when he was doing Sunset Strip, and we'd sit in a room and you know with me, Paul, and and David Banks, who was his. Yeah. I, David Banks. Yeah, David Banks used to crack me. What up. a David Banks was a former pimp turned minister. <laughs> David Banks is one of the great characters of all of time. Of all time, yes, he is. Yes, uh, he is. I love David Banks. He used to make me laugh. He used to get hit. He used to get on Paul Mooney's case. Oh my oh god! Oh my really? God! Oh my god! I wish I'd have recorded that. He was the, the, one of the final times I seen David Banks was probably six or seven years ago. He would juggle his ice cubes like a Cuban. You know, Cubans do that with yeah. their drink. They yeah. juggle their ice cubes. I love it. Yeah. They just juggle. And he's sitting there by the door in the comedy store at the back. And here by the comedy store sign, by yeah. that little V, is Paul Mooney, Eddie Murphy, <laughs> Arsenio Hall. <laughs> oh, my God. And uh, Johnny Gill. Oh, Johnny Gill? He's with Eddie Murphy at the time. And David Banks is fucking putting those ice cubes <laughs> and he's looking at those four and he's fucking juggling those motherfuckers <laughs> he's getting hotter by the minute now yeah. David Banks would talk to me from time to time he'd be up there with Eddie, Eddie Griffin maybe I, well, I don't know yeah. who he'd go up there with and there's one night he goes Cuba watch watch this and he goes right up to me he goes so when are you four motherfuckers gonna do the Queen's comedy tour 
<laughs> and that was the end. He Everybody went, went to their car. That was the end. He, what are you motherfuckers going to do? The Queen's a comedy talk. Oh, he was. That's hilarious. He was. Uh, you, you know, when you're around those guys, what, what impressed me about Richard uh, probably the most is how quick he was. We were standing in the hallway, and we were blocking a, a, blocking a scene, and LaWanda Page, remember her? Uh -huh. Great. LaWanda Page was great. And she was in the scene, and we're blocking. And I see coming down the hallway, Richard's facing me. I see coming down the hallway, Billy Barty. Now, for those of you who know Billy Barty, Billy Barty was the very first short person, or as they were referred to then, midget actors. He was working all the time. They were down. He worked all the time, all the that time. dude. Yeah. And yeah. they were doing a pilot down down the hall with Don Rickles, some Navy show, some Navy sitcom. I don't know what it was. And I see Billy Barton running up, and he tugs on Richard's jacket like from behind. He goes, and Richard turns around. Billy goes, "Hey, Richie, how you doing?" And Richard says, "Hey, Billy." Have you bumped into a good pussy lately? <laughs> <laughs> Have you bumped into any good pussy lately? What's the hardest the har the <laughs> hardest Richard Pryor ever made you laugh? The hardest that were you were just like you couldn't believe it. Wow. There was a night in the trailer. <laughs> There was a night in the trailer where uh, he started doing uh, Marvin Gaye. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it was bad, Marvin Gaye. But he was doing all the, you know, Mama, Mama, there ain't so many. Brother, brother, brother. You know, did all the moves like this. You know, what's going on, motherfucker? What's going on? <laughs> it was great. Always remember that. I, uh, you know, I the first time I ever even thought of comedy was when I seen him on the cover in the cave, and yeah, you know, was it was something I said or something, yeah, and that blew me away. And then uh, Bicentennial Nigga, the fucking movie, killed me. Yeah, you know the the movie. And I remember that's the night. I that scar. I got stabbed in Jersey City. They threw a knife, and that's the night. And when he said that, and I've been hearing what you motherfuckers been saying, and he took the lighter out. It it took that a lot to me was just. It took a lot of courage for him to do that movie. I mean, we went, we went to Peoria, to the house, in the room, where his mother did tricks. He wanted to do the show, the, the scene, in the house, in the room, where his mother did tricks. You talk about facing your demons. We went to Peoria, found a house, and shot it in the bedroom where his mom did tricks. And in the yard, he wanted the exact block when his dad used to clean fish, cut up fish, and he wanted to set up exactly the way he remembered it. To the de he detailed it. So that takes that takes a lot of uh, you know facing your demons head on. But Richard was courageous. I mean, let's face it, George was courageous. All the great ones are courageous. One of the sketches that was one of my favorites is there was a guy named Ernest Ainsley. He used to be like a, a, a late night, you know, you know, you come up, you, you come up in a wheelchair and he taps you on the head and suddenly you're walking, those guys, right. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I told Richard, I said, hurry up, hurry up, turn on TV. He said, what do you want me to watch? He said, watch this guy, Ernest Ainsley. You want me to do this? I go, no, we should do something like this. We always had writing meetings on Monday big conference table. He walks in and he jumps on the table and he said, let Bojars handle it. Bojars lives in the swamp. Let Bojars handle it. <laughs> and we go, Bojars, um, Boja, a, a, a gator done, a done ate my arm. What should I do? Find the gator. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we did this Bojars sketch and we did it and we did it deep in the Mississippi Delta, because one of my favorite rides was the entrance of Pirate of Caribbean. 
We have little little fireflies and all that. So I said, let's do the Mississippi Delta, like from Pirates of the Caribbean. And Roy Christopher was the art director, and Lon Stuckey lit it. And if you ever look at it, Bojoss, it's one of my favorites we ever did. You're going down this swamp, and then you come up to this tent, and there's a rip in the tent. And you go inside, all these people are moaning and groaning, oh, Lord, help me, Lord. And here comes Richard, this Bojoss, bare-chested with all the juju beans, and he's all going crazy. And he's, there was a basket with a fake snake in it. This is where I almost made it cross the line. In rehearsal, I took the face snake out and put a real one in. And when, he hates snakes. And when he picked up that snake, I was standing offside. He took the snake and he pointed it at me. He said, Bojo, I handled it. Right? And the snake is wrapping around his arm and stuff. It was great. Dave Chappelle told me that's his favorite scene of all the prior things we did. And how did we get away with it? Because they were afraid of the 100,000 pound gorilla. See, they were in a rock and a hard place. They had hired a guy that had no boundaries, language we understood, but pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope to do what he wanted to do, to say what he wanted to say. In the, in the guidelines of commercial television, he didn't think he could do it. He did it. He found a way of doing it. And that was so exciting. See, because you had that restriction, you had to work within the parameters of commercial television if they'd have left him alone with the naked opening, we don't know what we're talking about. But isn't it interesting? There's only four shows and one special. And they're the most talked about shows. It's where you ask, you ask Wayne's where in living, color, in living Color came from. You ask all those guys. So it's not the amount you do. It's what you do. Whatever that, that is. If it's one movie or one book, whatever it has impact, has impact. It sustains. Richard was courageous, and I was young and naive. <laughs> Rock, I gotta ask you something that you mentioned twice already. Yeah. Because I think about it once a week. This fucking craziness I got. The what? This thing that I live with. Yeah. This is what a stand-up comic should have. This, Rocco, I gotta be honest with you. Since the age of five, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. I don't. I'll smoke a joint in front of a cop. What are you gonna do to you? Yeah. You know, I've always had this thing that since I was a kid, I don't know where I got it. And at first, I thought it was like an act to get attention, but it's really, I don't give a fuck. I really don't. When you tell me no, I don't give a fuck. When you tell me yes, I don't give a fuck. If there's a rule, I'm not living to break it, but I don't give a fuck about it. But I'll tell you one thing, though, that I have found. Sometimes having a restriction can work in your favor. You follow I me? have a lot of restrictions also. No, I'm, I'm saying if, if, they're, if they're imposed on you. Let's say that you're going to do... Thank God. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Let's, yeah, say, yeah. let's say you have to do something. I'll make this up. Let's say you have to go talk before, you know, <clears throat> the Nuns Convention of America, right? You're going to do your jokes about religion in the, in the guise of what you think you need to say, not restricting how funny you are, but you understand the game you're in. Well, because the game that you're in, you will find even funnier ways of doing it because you know you can't say what you really want to say. So you say what you really want to say in the confines of what you're put in, and you'll be surprised what you'll come up with. You'll come up with some stuff that you didn't know you didn't have. I'm not saying freedom isn't good, but sometimes I think there's certain restrictions right. that is good that, that that works in your favor. Saturday Night Live works within a lot of restrictions, but they found a way of making that work. You get they found a way of being creative within the <coughs> guidelines that they that, that are set for them. Because you know, this commercial television it is run by Coca Cola and Ford and 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 those people that buy time. Uh, let's be honest, networks are run by 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 sponsors. They buy the time. You stay on the air. You get ratings. They, you know, I, yeah, I'm not saying that you don't know. Who pushed the envelope more, Pryor or uh, Carlin? From your point of view, can you answer that? Yeah. And I, it's not a cop-out. They both did, but they took a different path. They both grew up in the streets. George grew up in White Harlem. Right? Yep. Yeah, he did. 
Don't be mistaken. They were the same guy with the same... George came up with an unhappy home, you know, had a, had a loving family, but he, he realized that he was going to be a Catholic. He wanted to go left school to fifth, whatever he did. Became the master. He could, he could, he could go teach composition. Uh, here's a guy who didn't finish school, and yet he mastered the English language. Here's the difference. George considered himself a writer who performed his material. I don't think he saw himself as a comic first. He saw himself as a writer first. When George Carlin did a special, every word that he did on stage was on paper. Richard worked with what we called bullet points, structure within the bullet points, but then found certain rhythms on stage he could go off of, or if somebody said something in the audience he could pick up on and weave it through what he was going. He had a beginning, middle, and end, but he, but he could go off track. George, right on. He was right on track. And what would happen when, 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 I, when we're working with Richard, we go, uh, I gave him a word once called he asked me, what's the funniest word in, in Italian cooking? I said, scungili. You know, scungili is a squid, is a, is a, you know what it is. So he went on stage and he talked about being a comic at a strip club and going to get his money. So he goes to the mafia guy, he says, hey, I want some money. And he takes out a starter pistol and the guy laughs. He said, look at this, look at this nigga over here. Hey, get him some sazaj and put some skuzuj on it. And then add some zajij, right? That came out of skunjili. He found four definitions of skunjili and, 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 and weaved it into the piece. Hilarious. If George wanted to do skunjili, it'd be about skunjili. The definitive breakdown of what skunjili is and how it is, what it is, and make it funny. Both courageous. Look, George gave up Vegas. George gave up a living. One of the great things George ever did, he went on stage, he had a cardboard cut out of himself in a suit and tie, and he was standing with a beard, and he said, you see this guy? I knew this guy. He was a pretty good fellow, but there wasn't much to him. And he turned him around, and the cardboard was just blank. So he made a big jump. He did make a big, big switch. Jump, yeah. uh, I, like I didn't realize how much, but he I, I didn't know until I was uh, researching you on the internet, but he was a Vegas performer. Making money. But he was the suit and tie. and Making you know, money. Yeah. And he, uh, it's like I said before, if you're not, if your voice in you is telling you this is not what you should be doing, you can either listen to that voice and jump off into the abyss or... I'll play it safe, I'm making a living. George didn't. Richard, look what Richard did. You know, Richard worked. I remember he told me once, Bill Cosby came in and said, hey, stop doing my act. Because <laughs> Richard, because you know, big, his biggest influence was Cosby. And he started to find his own voice. Look what Richard talked about. Come on. He talked about growing up in a brothel. He talked about things that were... He put out an album out called That Nigger's Crazy. Come on. You, you know, you, 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 when you go back and look what these two guys did, prior Bruce and Carlin, you can put them in any order you want. You can take a pull of, the fur of those three guys. It'll be Bruce, Carlin, prior. Bruce, prior, Carlin. You, you, there is no way of putting two and three. If you had to put them in an order, it'd be where your preference was. If you prefer George, you're gonna go, you know, Bruce, George, Richard. If you prefer Richard, you're going to go Bruce, Richard, George. You never saw Lenny Bruce live, did you? No. George's hero. Huh? George's hero. None of us are here today. Lenny Bruce made the First Amendment. The First Amendment got him arrested. Freedom of speech got him arrested. Freedom of speech, you know, drove him crazy. He broke the barrier. When he said fuck on stage that night, and got arrested for it. Look what he did. You at you, God bless George. God bless Richard. They'll tell you, Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce paid the price. Somebody always has to pay the price. 
you know? Somebody's got to do it. You know, Gandhi paid it, right? Muhammad paid it. Jesus paid it. Everybody pays a price. And we all follow in that path. God bless them. Uh, I don't know if I'd have the courage just to, to pay the price. I, I may be paying the price and even know it. You may be. You may be. We don't know it. You're doing what you do. You're doing what you believe in. You do what you love to do. And the money will be there. I do believe that. But if you start compromising in the beginning, how are you ever going to know? How are you ever going to know what is in you if you're just trying to, nothing wrong with trying to make a living, but I gotta tell you, if you're honing seven minutes to get a sitcom, it's not gonna take you very far. No. Because when the sitcom's over. Fuck, even 20 minutes to get a sitcom. No. <laughs> but you're gonna go on the road. Look, guys who, guys who love going back, you talk to anybody who's had a successful sitcom. One of the reasons I really respect Jerry very much, Seinfeld, that guy's a master monologist. He's never gonna lose that art. He's got that down, man. He's really good. Leno works out every Sunday at the Comedy and Magic Club. Does an hour, hour and 25 minutes. You think he's doing that just for seven minutes on Tonight Show? That guy can take that act and go to the Ford Convention and do an hour and a half and get 100000 for the night. You know, it's not, it's not really surprising. If you are a stand-up comic, you are a master stand-up comic, and you keep that, knowing that that was your first art, go make your movies, go do your sitcoms, but you're going to come back home, man. That's where you have your roots. And they can take away your movie and say it's a bad movie. They can cancel your system, but they can't take away what you created, what you did on stage, what you believed in. They can't take that away from you. So it's obvious that you really still love comedy. Yeah. Right? Yeah? Yeah. Was there a point that you were like, fuck comedy? What else is there? Truthfully. Pussy. I mean, huh? <laughs> Huh? Pussy. Pussy? Oh, yeah. But if you're having good music, you're having good music and you're laughing, right? Chances are... The pussy's there. <laughs> the pussy's somewhere flying around. Yeah, and you're laughing music. in bed. So, yeah. you know, it all works out. Very true. Somebody came to me and said, um, they think Richard's doing coke. Now this is the the, part, the show that you shot the pilot as the head writer. This was a series now. This was this, a different. This is a different. This uh, we were going to do um, a Star Wars bar, and you're supposed to do Mudbone. Okay. And somebody came to me and said, uh, "Richard's late. He's being difficult. We think he's doing coke." And I said, "What do you? You're the producer. What are you telling me? You telling me to go ask him?" Could we? You're the producer. We think the network's concerned. So, all right. I don't give a shit. I go and say, Rich, the network's concerned. I think you're doing coke. So what did you just say to me? I said, I'm just telling you what they said. Get out of here. You're fired. I went, what? You're fired. Wow. Well, I, I didn't even know what to say. David Banks pulls me out in the hallway. He said, come down the hall with me. What's wrong with you? I'm in the room. I'm in the room with them. Are there people in the room? What is wrong with you? Well, I didn't think it was a big... No, no. If you're going to do that, you got to do it in private, man. You embarrassed them. Don't go away. Had a dressing room. Double dressing room. So, I won't mention the people that were present, but there were network people there and and uh, he said to these people, you know, Rocco came in here and asked me if I was doing coke. And I fired him. And they went, oh, well, that's too bad. They were happy I was gone, right? And I said, do you people think I've been doing coke? You know, no, we don't. We don't know, Rich. We didn't. Well, how do you? Where do you think you got the idea? He said it came from you people. Well, we don't think. He says, you know what? You're all a bunch of fucking lying. You get the fuck out of my room. Get the fuck out of here. Fuck y'all. And by the way, I just hired Rocco back, and I'm going to give him a raise. Because he's the only one that came and said anything to me. 
where were you? So I get back in his office, and he said, the only thing you did wrong, man, is you embarrassed me. Don't ever embarrass me. Now, you think I'm doing coke? I said, personally, I don't give a fuck. I just know that in half an hour we have to do this, this scene. And if you're on coke or no coke, don't matter to me. Let's just do the show. But show up because, again, I'll get fired if you don't show up, and I will drag your ass out there if I have to. And he went out and did Mudbone. It was great. So I still today don't know. I still don't know. And it doesn't matter, does it? It don't matter. So I got fired and rehired. And he told the network to go fuck off. And they never bothered them again. I don't think the naked opening was exactly an uncalculated move. I do believe today that they knew exactly what was going to happen. I don't want to be this cynical. But when I think about it, you go make us go through all that process. Make us shoot it. Make it edit it. Did you think for one minute, did I really think for one minute that was going on TV? Absolutely. Was I completely young and naive about it? Absolutely. And what happened? It turned out great for us. All of us benefited from that, didn't we? Half those network people are probably gone, out of work. We don't know where the hell they are. Half them may be dead. That naked opening is going to be on forever. That naked opening is recorded, man. It's on video tape. It'll outlive me and outlive anybody in this room because somebody had the courage of their convictions to say something that they believed in. And that's what the power of truth is. Whether it's Richard's naked opening or whoever, you know, uh, uh, you write a book. <clears throat> Whatever you do in the arts, you know, I remember there's a great story about um, Michelangelo, um, about um, Da Vinci. There was a painter, it was an artist named Verrocchio. And, you know, back in the Renaissance, they would have these apprentices. They would outline the, 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 the scenes and say, go fill it in, you know, like paint by numbers, but they would put it in their own style. So supposedly, this young apprentice that Verrocchio hired, named Da Vinci, did such a great job that he gave up painting and became a famous sculptor. He said, I can't top this kid. This kid's great. So Da Vinci doesn't get that job of painting an angel, you know, blowing a horn, whatever the hell it is. Would Da Vinci be Da Vinci? But you think when he painted that, he said, well, I don't want to upstage Verrocchio. He said, screw Verrocchio. I'm going to paint my goddamn angel. By the way, if you have liked today's podcast, can you do us a big fat favor and go to iTunes and go to our Beauty and the Beast page and leave a comment, a nice little sweet comment, nothing obnoxious, nothing like, you know, Joey's the king, but who the fuck is Felicia kind of bullshit, but just something like, you know, I appreciate the editing and that you take time away from your children to put the show together, things like that, that would be wonderful. Or you can go and uh, to our website at Beauty and the Beast. Dot com and you can email Mr. Joey Diaz. You can also get our RSS feed there uh, directly if you don't have iTunes. And uh, and you can email Joey, and Joey's really good at returning the emails. At Beauty and the Beast podcast uh, at, at gmail.com. Gmail also, for a word from our sponsors, how about a big round of applause for ballcancersucks.com. Go to the webpage, get your ball sacks tested, go on the webpage, support, get a t shirt. They have shipping, the whole fucking deal. And I'll tell you what, the main message they're putting is to get your ball sack tested. Just check them out. If you got a lump in there, yeah. go fucking down. You don't want to be walking around with what We're fucking nuts. We're going to retweet nut. some of their uh, tweets that they yeah. do about checking your nuts. But you got to check your nuts because you might have. <laughs> it's fucked up yes, walking into a party. I said that with a straight face. <laughs> it's fucked up walking to a party with one nut. So please, go to ballcancersucks.com. Also, the Tainted Vision arts.com also to no whore organic to get your new little eureka fucking vapor pen also to my man rock or bc to coming down he's like i love you to death you thank you're you. an inspiration to all the comedians yeah. and i've very always cool. respected you thank you very much well, thank, you, thank you for showing me respect and yeah, having me on you're I a bad it. motherfucker though you're the last of the real deal you know in this world of fugazis <laughs> you're the real fucking deal Felicia, where you at this week? Well, uh, I am going to be at the Improv next Wednesday night on the 16th. Come on out. Uh, I, I have an unlimited guest list. 
Mm. So come on out uh, to that show. That would be great. And where are you at? I am at this weekend coming up, the 11th and 12th. I'm at the Scottsdale, Arizona, at the Comedy Spot. Great club. Uh, four shows, 480-945-4422. And next week, I'm in Columbus, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. I'm doing the fucking blue collar to the balls. That's my hometown. That's Cleveland. Cleveland. That's, yeah, baby. And it rocks, and I'm fucking ready to go. Yeah, baby. If you want tickets for... Uh, the Columbus Show, the Grog Shop in Cleveland, or I forget the name in Pittsburgh, go to brownpapertickets.com. We're there. And beside that, I love you motherfuckers. Have a great week. Stay black. <laughs>